Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, nice, small, intimate group, uh, the best kind. <laughs> um, before we start the salon, um, I'd like to welcome you all to Palmerston Library Theater. It's a fantastic space. And I would like to thank uh, Yana uh, Georgieva Kaluba, the librarian here, for her support for this series and for creating a flyer and an event and uh, posting it all over the library system. And to Misuk Headman, who's the manager, Branch Head, who's just been absolutely marvelous because um, Iana's away right now and Misuk has helped me set up and you know the library's providing refreshments. And um, so I'm very grateful um, for the library for, you know, letting us run this here is a beautiful space and for promoting the event. So I really recommend using the library to, to read um, poets. We've got um, uh, three incredible features today. Uh, we've got Elana Wolf and Susie Berg and they are going to do a collaborative piece. They recently had a Lyrical Miracle chapbook published. And I went to the launch, and they riff off each other and inspire each other, and they've got poems about similar topics, and then they one will write a poem, and the other one will be inspired and write a poem. And, and it's just an incredible of synergy, so I'm very excited uh, to welcome them to this salon, and they are going to be reading some of their collaborative work as well. They will be reading some of their own poetry, and Jim McQuaig is an incredible guitarist. Oh, I'm so happy. So welcome to the really April, the April <laughs> that's really May 3rd. <laughs> Poetry and Music Salon. And uh, we're going to start with some open mics. I'd just uh, like to welcome Roman. And uh, Roman is a geneticist originally, I think. And then moved to Costa Rica. <laughs> and then came back to Toronto and then started writing poetry. Welcome. Thanks, Brenda. Yeah, just a bit of background. Back in the 80s uh, in Switzerland, I worked as a lab technician in a genetic engineering laboratory. And the word palindrome played a big role in my life then. And palindrome is a Greek word uh, that means to run backwards. And so in DNA, <clears throat> you have two strands. And if you flatten it out on a piece of paper, you have an upper strand and a lower strand. The upper strand has a sequence, a chemical sequence. And palindromes, the sequence on the upper, stra upper, the upper strand, read left to right, is exactly the same as the sequence on the bottom strand, read from right to left. So I wrote this little poem called Back and Forth. <laughs> Crystal balls, tarot cards, and the I Ching all tie in to the palindromes of that DNA thing. ACGT, TGCA. Palindrome, palindrome, where do you roam? You say the ladder of life is your home. So what about the hairs in my comb? DNA is and spelled backwards. Who knew that a word so small turned around would have the power to pull God to the ground. Palindrome, palindrome, where do you roam? Words and dates the same forwards as backwards. Did anyone scream, those dates are deadly? Times pass hard as bombs ring out their medley. Fluid mosaic, doesn't sound prosaic. Mother Earth should reign and not be archaic. Sol gel pseudopods flow from the soul to engulf desire and promise a fantasy role. Too bad, that could, too bad that it can end in an empty dust bowl. Palindrome, palindrome, where do you roam? Year 11 to 2002. Did we think of all we could do? 2002 was a sexy palindrome with a plan to make Mars our new home. Why build from scratch? We're under the same stars. I guess we're just crazy looking for new cars. 2002, the last palindrome we'll see. I hope for the best for what will come to be. O2, CO2, 2002. Was there enough oxygen in this dome we call home? Let's make sure there is for the next palindrome. Thank you. 
Thank you, Roman. And uh, next, I would like to invite Kate up to read a poem. And I know Kate from many years of dancing. Yeah. Welcome. This poem is called Snake Skin. Running, 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 to not stand still. Running, running, to escape the misery of memory. Running, 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 to escape the labyrinth of the past. Racing down hallways, an infinite, an infinity of mirrors of judgment, telling me who I am and who I am not. I don't want to feel the self-doubt and frozenness of stillness. As the pressure builds up, all I can do is run. But as I run and run and run, the shadow chases me, hounding me at my heels, as it always has. Should I turn around then and disrobe, be the snake shedding her outworn skin. Are we kind to those who shed their skins, who dare to show a glimmer of soft silk underneath the cross hatchings of their surface coverings, molded to fit the world? Who are we beneath these folds and armaments? The unveiling self has many treasures hidden beneath the webbing of our skins and stories. It's a tender time when we shed our old familiar skins, become strangely vulnerable in this world called human. I wonder, do snakes cry when they shed their skins. Thank you. I like snake poems. <laughs> okay, well, welcome, Stedman. He's fantastic. He's brilliant. He often comes to the salons. I'm so honored, and I'm glad you're here. Yeah. by light, kittens terrified of carpet, puking up dry water in a diamond hell, serpents of the universe whose unhatched eggs are planets, eagle-headed goddesses slowly pecking your way out of my cosmic egg, the emaciated cows of India are skinny dipping in, the emaciated cows of India sniffing something that probed my brain are skinny dipping into our sparsely wooded area to the grating sound of spare change, spare change, spare change. Our rich bastards are heaving themselves poorly out of the stained glass windows, 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 windows of the skyscrapers and overpriced condos that hover over us godzillily, like Mothra. A 13th century woodcut of a dazzling asteroid. Sam paints a white streak across the board straight aristocratic back of a regal black sun as a newly minted meteor shaves the soft stubble off of the planet Earth's face. Our full chaotic stomachs are growling in unison inside the treehouse of the tea house of the August moon. Breaking news! Rauschenberg has erased the cooning. People are standing in front of churches, mosques, synagogues, ashrams, and temples, burning the Torah, the Talmud, the Quran, the Book of Mormon, Dianetics, and every kind of sutra, treaties, and Bible to ignite a combustible crowd. So five storms have left 222 dead, knocked out power to millions of homes on the east coast of the United States, a large wildfire raging across 
Canada has contributed to a smoky haze lingering above the western part of the USA, causing a spectacular red sunset. War planes are thundering over Libya, Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq still. Thousands of Israelis are taken to the streets to protest the rising cost of living. And a doctor in Stockholm was convicted of drugging several of her male patients with milk chocolate covered strawberries laced with rohypnol today. Lindsay Lohan is back in rehab today. The, the way you sleep can reduce wrinkles. A pearl faced dolphin who may or may not sleep talk a beached whale song is jumping aboard an aerial boat today, injuring a woman in South Florida tomorrow. A number of erotic suspects have been euthanized on the Gaza Strip of the meth lab of our collective imagination. Tsunamis of unsettling sensations, bloated, waterlogged bodies, flash floods, rolling blackouts, deserted pets, separated families, evacuated cities full of centaurs being enveloped in rising walls of worse fears, generously erected. Three alpha males are sipping king cans of liquid genitals in Trinity Bellwoods Park as we speak. Oh, battered runaways? Low. Elegant technological savages becoming loose and scary? Your abusive alcoholic father is now entering the realm of the mothers. Abraxas equals 365. Seatbelts save lives. According to the Franklin Parish Sheriff's Office, Sharmika Mofet was wearing a Donald Trump t-shirt when the assailants allegedly doused her with racial slurs and gasoline and scrawled the letters NAACP upon the hood of her beat-up truck. A bullied BCT suicide sparked political action in Ottawa, and a rescue dog shot in the head 50 times by a pellet gun in Nova Scotia has found a loving new home. Must the resplendent contents of my petrified bowls beware your raging spoon? And the eyes of March, who will be our trusted companions in our final moments within this physical plane? I'm changing the channel. I'm turning off the news now. I'm loitering on the marble streets of oblivion. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to have our two beautiful, brilliant women come up. Okay, so Susie Berg is the co-curator of Toronto's Plasticine Poetry Reading Series and the author of the poetry collection, How to Get Over Yourself. The blog, the Starbucks Poetry Project, and three chat books, Paper Cuts, Awaiting Butterflies, um, and You Will Still Have Birds, a conversation in poetry with Alana Wolf. Her work has appeared in such journals as Carte Blanche, Ars Media, and Switchback, and in the anthologies The Mom Egg Review, Desperately Seeking Susan's and Body and Soul. She's the editor of the upcoming anthology Catherine the Great, Catherine's the Great, <laughs> um, which is due in 2017, and uh, she's got a website. Um, uh, yes, it's a complicated website. She's also on Twitter. And Alana Wolf is a poet, editor, essayist, and designer, and facilitator of therapeutic community art courses. Her poems have appeared in journals and anthologies in Canada, the US, the UK, and France. Her bilingual collection of selected poems, Helio Boris, hello Boris, Hella Boris and Alcamilia. Uh, that was 213, translated by Stephanie Rosler, uh, was awarded the 214 John Glasso Prize for translation. Her essay, Paging Kafka's El Elegiast, Elegiast, Elegist, 
I have that. (laughs) And I've read it, and it's amazing. (laughs) Won the new Quarterly's 215 Edna Stabler Personal Essay Contest and is nominated for a National Magazine Award. Alana's fifth collection of poetry is forthcoming with Guernica in 217. And um, I believe in her second set, she might share some poems from the forthcoming collection. So I'd like to welcome these two gorgeous ladies. (laughs) Okay, so is this good? Can you hear us? Okay, what about Susie, you're first. Hear me if I'm here. So... uh, this is, this is our collection, You Will Still Have Birds. And uh, this started with uh, my going to hear Alana read one night. The reason I went to hear her read is that Karen Schenfeld said, you should really meet Alana. And so I went to hear Alana read, and her reading was wonderful. I'd actually heard her read before, but I actually went that night with the express purpose of being not afraid to go talk to her. Um, <laughs> she's very <laughs> frightening. Um, it turns out she's not frightening at all. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I was listening to her read, and she's a wonderful reader, and I was completely engaged. And then an item in her poem did not kick me out of the poem, but absolutely blew me away because she talked about uh, one of her ear piercings being higher than the other, and or lower than the other. And I have one ear piercing that's lower than the other, because my grandfather pierced my ears for me. And, and, and he let them grow in and he did them again. And I was completely floored by this, that somebody, somebody else would have the same experience as me. After Alana finished reading, I went up and spoke to her. I told her I knew Karen. I told her Karen had you know, suggested we, we speak. And I completely forgot to tell her about this really strange quirk. And I went home that night. I'd bought her book. I went home. I wrote a poem in response to that poem and in response to the idea of this shared quirk. And amazingly enough, Alana wrote me back. And that turned into an ongoing conversation, both on the page and in person, about poetry and creativity and truth and art. And it evolved into um, this collection. Um, I was absolutely amazed when Alana took my collection with her, and then said, I was really struck by these things, and I wrote some some poetry in response to yours, and I was like, what? (laughs) Uh, Okay. Um, You know, wonderful, award-winning, talented poet, and an incredible teacher, and a very generous, generous writer. Okay. She is... Oh, we ha- I have to. We have to run out of time. Okay, no. And so um, we we ended up with this book as the result of um, this brief conversation and this unusual shared trait. And it turns out it's not the only trait that we share. Thanks for that introduction, Susie. And I'm going to share with you the poem that got it started in the first place from a reading at Live Words back in October of 2013. And the poem is titled On Editing, and uh, it's about the editing experience and how you can find yourself mirrored in another person's work and what that leads to, and then what it led to. So here's the poem that got it going, On Editing. Pencil in corrections and suggestions. Mint for her, my words, misread, her writing, mine, the merger. Her memories, mine, the mix. Overlapping Catherine's hypotheticals, a foreign friend. From whom I learned a visionary word, seer. As vague and veiled at twelve as Quasimodo. New girl with the lamp black hair and Esmeralda dresses. Tiny pearl pierced earrings from Bombay. Pierced for me is not allowed. I ice my lobes to pull the sewing needle through in secret. Turn the doubled thread each day to keep the holes from closing. Till I save enough for studs. 
Gold, so bold, remote, so near, so pearly near my lobes, they show the error of my way. One stud, always higher, one stock lower than the other. And that last little bit, in fact, pretty much all of it is truthful. <laughs> I have the lower piercing still. <laughs> I'm marked. And um, yeah, that gave rise to um, the beginnings of our conversation. And as uh, Susie said, I, um, I got her book. She got my book. I started reading. And then, of course, the merger started happening. And then I had a very interesting experience. I, um, I found myself mirrored in one of Susie's poems, and actually for the first time in my life, and it's never happened since, a poem came to me on the spur of the moment, and I penciled it all in right into the book. And um, that was um, my response to Susie's poem, John Massey. So I'm going out of this, and now I'm going into our book. Right, Susie? Right. <laughs> Susie will read the response to that poem first. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> We're professionals here. Parents are an easy target. And, and unlike Alana's poem, only part of this poem is true. I wear the scar of errant ear piercing, the hole in one lobe lower than the other. The white hot glare my mother surely gave her father for getting it wrong. I conjure her dead in some way that is easy, but not too sudden. Do not want the burden of her, one of those old smokers who lives forever. While she is in treatment, I inventory kitchen cupboards for sugar cubes and plastic cups we will need during Shiva. I locate the coffee urn, relieved that I will not always need a place for her. Urns are not an option in her chosen faith. Thanks for that. Yeah. And, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry about that, Susie. Um, so, to pick up. I bought Susie's book, <laughs> and I started to read it. And of course, uh, a number of poems jumped out, but one in particular inspired me to do the thing of writing a poem on the page, which I did. And we included in our chat book a, um, a photograph, a very poor photograph, I have to say. It didn't come out great, of, um, of the page in which I, I, I wrote the piece. <laughs> so what I'm going to do. Correct me if I'm wrong, Susie. I'm going to read, first of all, Susie's poem. And then I'll read my response piece. <laughs> it's been a long day. What can I tell you? <laughs> there. So Susie's poem is um, another poem after another art piece. So it's after, 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 or four, four, four. Hers is after John Massey. We reflect in the, in the window, wine, flowers. We spy on ourselves, bleed from the room until we are bubbled in glass, suspended. We float. The sea rushes blue into the house. We are curtains, hang, upstairs mounted in frames on the wall. The water climbs, leaves river prints in the hallway. Mirrors follow door by door, hooked on the wall, your hat behind the red chair. I read, see us in this magazine. We bleach to white, pile in corners, like clouds, like, like the socks on the radiator. The same color as the carnations I never gave you. So I'm not going to even enumerate all the ways in which I find myself mirrored in this piece. But um, the poem came out of it, came out of it very spontaneously, and I titled it Needy. 
We reflect on the window, its panes and breaks. Look at ourselves looking into the straits. The moon comes through. We take it as the great big pill it is in swallow position, standing up. Then shrink, heads first, legs next. Our middles balloon to bobble bellies. These are the bodies we wanted, yes. Also the sex and gender. We got the parents we wanted as well. Even arranged the marriage from our choir invisible seats. So it was a bad match, exactly what we needed for genes, appearances, and growth. Every night I go for a walk, I fall for the same black shadow. <laughs> So one of the things Alana and I have in common is that we both like to walk. She's braver than I am. I don't walk alone in the dark, but she does. Um, Alana had a poem that she talked to me about and said it wasn't being included in a, in a particular collection. And I said I would love to hear it because I have a thing about Elijah and Elijah figures that appear in different kinds of art. And this was a poem about Elijah. So this is Alana's poem, and afterwards I'm going to read you one of the three poems <laughs> that happened as a result of this poem. It, was, it just kept going for me. Like being saved by Elijah the prophet, man, a sudden man, appears before me on the walk, leering man between the path and thicket. Here we are, and how am I to think? The comic man? In fact, he is a solitary walker, and it's night. Strong, deposing, weaker is the standard. I am blanched. Extraordinary man. His arms are twine, his fingers twist. He hisses in my ear. I smell the meat and taste the chaos. Fear his force and ugliness, the lust. I might have been prepared for deposition, but I bray. A figure dashes in, like grace and fable. The man, as if imagined, topples off. The simplest answer, yes, it's so, even though I have no marks to prove it. Encounter. No marks that you can see. My fingers know where to find them. I mold a truth like bricks. Enter stage right, the villain, dashing. I forget my lines, mouth soundless, a puppet, man of straw staked in a field, to watch, invisible circles, bullseye, roadkill. Face to face with this sudden man, I struggle to remember the rules of self-defense, Wonder instead why a figure sketched from branches frightens most in winter. Raccoons scream behind hedges. That could be me. Taken against my will, I might have liked it. And I realized I read the wrong poem. We're doing so well. <laughs> Yeah, Susie just realized she read the wrong poem, so to speak, but that's fine. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> oh, we're having some fun. Yeah. yeah. So we're jumping towards the end, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that Susie will read one of her pieces that um, led to the final piece in the collection. I should say there are a number of different kinds of processes that we went through, including um, an art process. I led uh, Susie through um, a collage, a stage of um, collage steps, and um, from that we did a truly collaborative poem, probably the most collaborative poem in the in the entire chat book. But um, yeah, it's too difficult to present, and with the art. So we'll skip right to the end, and um, Susie will read her piece. All times are uncertain, right? Mm -hmm. 
As opposed to reading the title poem, which is what I was supposed to read you. So that means you all have to buy a copy, and then you'll be able to read the title poem. So this, this is actually a cento. This is a collection of lines gathered from my own journals to create this poem. All times are uncertain. It's a tough life wanting it all, and I have forgotten to breathe. The clock knows the truth. People die when you leave town. When you last watched the movement of water, waited for story in the space in between, you saw her purple glasses, days when good hair still mattered. The topic is sugar, silence of the ruined. I think of being grateful for snow, try to remember storms. Yeah, and so um, that piece actually gave rise to a few by me in here as well, but I'm just going to read the, um, the closing poem, which is titled Dyads. I guess a fancy word for two. Right, John? Pairs of two. Pairs, okay. Pairs of two? I'll never change it again. Okay. <laughs> All right, dyads. All times are uncertain as in all times are modern. It's a tough life, each to her own catastrophe. If you forget to breathe, the autonomic system soon kicks in, even underwater. The clock to time as the parrot to talk. What if it were dead and the air retained its lexicon? What then? Brother, your force was abortive. Your name was supposed to be life, and you never arrived. I see you in my dyad. Heart was first an organ of warmth. Every child born with a torch and a personal flurry. Thank you. That was absolutely terrific. Um, I think that was a better reading than you did at the launch. You you were like, you yes, you were, you were more of a team this time, and maybe it, it, you've done it a few times, so you're a little. <laughs> I kind of like some feedback on. I usually do these salons on a Saturday afternoon, and I usually have a nice size group on the Saturday if I'm at some place long enough, you know, a couple of months. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm wondering, because uh, when I do it on a Saturday afternoon, it would always be at an art gallery, and so you'd come out to see the show, and you know, you'd maybe go to some of the other galleries in the area, and uh, maybe some shopping. But just coming to the library on a Saturday is quite, quite different. And um, I'm thinking maybe switch to an evening, like a Tuesday evening once a month. Anyway, but think about it and just let me know on Facebook or before we close today, you know, what you think you might come out to more often. How about that? <laughs> Okay, we're going to uh, start with three amazing open mics. Not everybody's an amazing open mic. Steve Paul Sims um, is a Toronto musician and um, absolutely delighted he's here. I was busy videoing and turned around and there he was. And um, he doesn't have a guitar, but he's going to use Jim's and he's going to come and share a song with us. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Well, this is a song about two uh, attractive young people who met in, in the most unlikely of places and fell in love, that is. Loblaws. Yeah. And it uh, goes something like this. It's Sunday at La Blas. I'm icing the cake. She's 
sweeping the coffee aisle I'm stuck in the bakery I heard her talking Spanish Merda, I went and studied Francais So I bought a dictionary And it told me what to say Te quiero Elizabeth Te quiero Te quiero Elizabeth Y te amo Te quiero Elizabeth Te quiero Te quiero Elizabeth I love you She majored in business I guess we're both pretty smart She gets to my brain Just like she goes to my heart When you meet somebody new Who knows where it might be lead I got a feeling I like She's just what I need te quiero Elizabeth, te quiero, te quiero Elizabeth, y te amo. Te quiero Elizabeth, te quiero, te quiero Elizabeth, I love you. It's not such a bad job Slicing pumpernickel bread Spend most of my days Just writing songs in my head Then I see her again So dark and so pretty One day we'll build us a home North of Mexico City te quiero Elizabeth, te quiero, te quiero Elizabeth, te amo. Te quiero Elizabeth, te quiero, te quiero Elizabeth, I love you. Y para todos los días Y hasta el último de la tierra I guess I'm trying to say I will always love you so much Steve Paul that was very impromptu and uh, that was wonderful <laughs> and uh, now we're going to have a poet he's a very dear friend he's uh, we've collaborated on a few things yes John Otten Thanks, Brenda. Um, we heard in a previous open mic set about uh, snakes losing their skins. Well, this is a poem called Snakes and Trains, and it was inspired by an article I uh, just read in the Atlantic Monthly called The Case Against Reality. A professor of cognitive science argues that the world is nothing like the one we experience through our senses. So the prosy parts of this are actually quoted from that article, including the first bit. Snakes and trains 
like the particles of physics, have no objective observer-independent features. Distant decurical locomotives puff along my memory's far wall. Art Deco engines pull jazz bands packed with dead musicians. Snakes squirm like the Gorgon's hair just before she locks eyes with you. The snake I see is a description created by my sensory system to inform me of the fitness consequence of my actions. A too slow imagining and the puncturing hiss poisons my fitness. The speeding express flattens assumptions about which track I'm on. A snake is an acceptable solution to the problem of telling me how to act in a situation. My snakes and trains are my mental representations. Let us compare trains, race snakes, while you writhe my steel lines like the particles. Your snakes and trains are your mental rep representations. Please pack the snakes with your planes not the train which I imagine I am on. I can never show you mine, cannot imagine yours. And I'll read one more. We heard, oh, thank you. We heard a kind of happy, hopeful love song here, so here's a sad, depressed love poem. You know, we all need some of those. Oh my, oh my foolish heart, etc. What lies beneath Latin laziness, several country songs, failed comedy plots, proof that chaos theory underpins our lives. Item, I was going to be her man. Together we would erase the dust from our scrapbooks of love, but I sneezed too loudly. Item, I wanted to kiss her among the gravestones, but desire died too. <laughs> Item, she gave me her second country, but not her secret bower. Item, I misread instructions from love seat parts, built a work table. Item. Her online description was romantic fiction. Item, she wanted my ex, but I could not see why. Thank you, John. Item. <laughs> so our last open mic is a very special man who's becoming a nice friend, um, Stanley Pfefferman. He was a professor of English at York for something like 40 years, and I actually took his course Come on down. Uh, many years ago, and uh, he did Buddhism in literature, and I've never forgotten him on Leonard Cohen and Yeats. I know. <laughs> All Thanks. these years. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's funny you should mention Yeats because I'm going to open just with a remark on one of his poems. I've prepared a, just a suite of poems, four, uh, four little poems. They're on the subject of love, romantic love. And uh, the guru in romantic love, of course, is Yeats. And um, the passage, the sacred passage is, love has pitched his mansion in the place of excrement. Not very nice, but very true. And what it means to me, and somehow inspires me, is that if you're going to have love affairs and write about them, you probably have to go through a lot of shit. Unless, you know, you're doing the Hallmark card things, which I don't do, so. This one is called, this, uh, I'm not, uh, they have titles, but when I run them as a suite, I'm just going to read them. What, what finally made it work was the thought that you were the wife of someone else, the wife of an important man who was breaking your heart with someone else, the way my wife was breaking my heart by falling in love with someone else, also an important man who also wanted to leave his wife and finally make it work with someone else. What finally made it work was the thought that I was an important man and you were the wife of someone else and I was that someone else. So you were my wife sleeping with someone else and I was that someone else, and that way I could make it work that my wife was sleeping with someone else. <laughs> well, what finally made it work was the thought that I was sleeping with someone else, and you were that someone else, a human being, naked like myself, except for your blouse, as we held each other and rocked. What finally made it work was the thought that I was just someone else 
who just fallen in love with you. Thank you. Your body curled under me like calligraphies of smoke from the burning tip of an incense stick set in the earth of a potted rose bush that stands on a table near the window. Her scars. This woman wears wounds, signatures of scalpel on breast, neck, and along the leg. This woman was captured, racked, broken backed over necessity's edge. Still, she comes soft as cat, terrible her attack. Her scars are smiles of tigress. We were disciplined and shining, two luminous spiders making our pilgrimage up a vertical cliff, cheerfully catching each nuance and rift in the broad face of love that unrolled under us in the winter sun. Spring is coming, but you are gone. The odor of lovers is in the wind, and I am hungry for their knowledge. I wonder what you're doing. I'm spinning a map of our travels. I'm starting a tour for the flies. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley. So uh, Susie's going to come up and share some of her own poetry. Um, and I've already done an intro, so. All right, I'm, I'm going to start with a less sad one and then read a more sad one. Let's call it that. Reading Ellen Bass. Reading Ellen Bass makes me want to open the gates to all the angels, the ones who distract me while I practice yoga, the ones who enter during sex and hand me a list of phone calls I've been meaning to make, even the angel Vadim, who walks into our front hall one Saturday afternoon while the children eat grilled cheese sandwiches and becomes family code for violation, though we shout him out and bolt the door. Makes me want to be described in thighs by someone who knows that my legs, plump with the DNA of Eastern Europe, are coded to cover more mat as the years tumble forward makes me want to brag about the way I wake in the dark to your hands creating my body out of dreams, the weight of your mouth on my lips, the way you talk me up and over, using your fingers to describe what your tongue wants to do, makes me want to argue with you in the kitchen and then tell the world about it because it was a silly argument anyway, and when I tell it, I intend to replace all the war words with dancing. This poem is actually modeled on an Ellen Bass poem. I am reading it in memory of my 30-year-old cousin who passed away last week, um, who had found her way into this poem a couple of months ago. And it's called Falling. The first time I dropped the baby, she was asleep in my arms, dreaming her startle breath dreams. A stare unexpected, an uneven fault for my foot. I fell and released infant cries from her lungs, sang her all the way to emergency. Once I fell for a line I thought would be a legend for the ages, like William Tell shooting an apple off his son's head. Falling into a stranger's bed, hidden by miles and dark, splayed like a starfish opening to water, the hooded, spongy flesh yearning. The asteroid, cooling as it falls, heat retreating from the sun's glow, earth blasted black. Post-collision, the flesh of giants turns to ash, 
exposing smooth bone, dry as the surprise of snakeskin. When the apple is eaten from the tree, it's a lie to point to Eve's pliant arms and cushioned breasts, her velvet pelt. After the code is cracked, it's a lie to hide the fallen words again. Every August, astronomers advise we look to the skies for the Perseids, showers of falling stars. We are wrong to say they're falling, or stars. They are tiny bits of rock that track into Earth's atmosphere and burn up. They flash a brief trail of light that moves across the sky, not down. Laura shaved her head so she wouldn't have to watch her hair fall prey to the teeth of the comb, a pool on her pillow. Ellen Bass wrote that in Nakedness, using the name and truth of my cousin filling up with poison. The two women are strangers. It's a complete coincidence and tragedy. The curls fall to the floor. A different Laura, when I was six years old and she was seven, pushed me from, from the flat, low roof of her garage. She stood behind me, pressed her hands to my shoulders. Then I was on my face in snow, bleeding into the white ground. All I remember is crying and running back home across the street, telling the story that would become how I got this scar on my nose. Most other stories I can still recall belong to my sister. Years we rolled breathless down the hill in the snowfall of January, powdered in our forts and tunnels. I love to fall asleep in the afternoon under a blanket heavy enough to make my limbs and brain stop moving. When my son taught himself to play guitar, he started with Tom Petty's Free Falling. He found it on the internet. That was long ago. The guitar is mostly quiet now. When we visited our cousins in California, though, we sang together every time we saw signs for Reseda or drove along Ventura Boulevard seeking vampires. We sang so loud you'd have thought he wasn't depressed. Later, I remembered those mornings he refused to leave the bed, fallen already into a gray he couldn't describe. We name the stages of the maple in our yard for what falls from its branches and tracks its way inside. The sticky, colorless sap, then the yellow fuzz, the maple keys, the leaves, the leaves. Standing under the rushing waterfall at Dunn's River Falls in Jamaica with my family when I was eight and afraid of lizards and crabs. The small island in Halifax Harbor that signaled landfall for my infant mother shipped to a new life. Singing, ring around the rosy with our toddlers, alarmed that our words echoed the bubonic plague, red rashes wringing the skin, children falling dead, the bodies burned to ash. When we looked it all up online, the folklorists told us it was an urban legend, and we were grateful to believe. When you look through the glass at your boy, you can only see how far he has fallen, this angel. You replay this boy standing in the kitchen, holding the baseball bat, his grip once practiced hand over hand under his father's grip, now swinging the bat so it falls from backswing to follow through at the father's head and the father falls to the floor. But you can't stop thinking about your son's falling hands the first time the two of you made shadow puppets on the wall. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Susie. And now uh, we get to hear Elena on her own. Um, and uh, so looking forward to that. Okay. 
I think we're in position. Thanks, Brenda. Uh, thank you for organizing this soiree for this event, and this is a wonderful venue. I put my two cents in. <laughs> so I'm going to um, read one longer piece and then uh, two shorter pieces. And as uh, Brenda said, I'm giving you a preview of my upcoming collection. This one will appear in that next year. And it's, um, it's titled... Ouija board. Even though it looks like Ouija board, everybody tells me it's pronounced Ouija board. Okay, this is it. I was slaked like a calf at the teat last night, perhaps because the stars were low. So low their leaky light suffused the garden. This morning I was parched, Puppy dug a backyard hole, your wallet gone from where you put it, lying on the earth beside the digger and the vinca. Puppy on the sofa gnawing rawhide with a grin. She nuzzles you, she whimpers, and a word like squirrel drips as spittle from her ruddy tongue. We leave her with the fish and walk to the pond. I tell you, spring will be benign, umbilical, like love. Rain has made a Ouija board of dark, elusive letters on the path. I pull the planchette back, which means no automatic talk, no plotting. I mean, we're here, extemporizing, slipping into mist, the scent of daffodils and grass. We pause before the water and our breath turns into breeze. I tell you, spring will be benign, resilient. I want this. A sister is beside herself, beside the flimsy scrim of self, impinged by force so strong it hogs her body. Eyes complexly deadpan, and it's not enough to look to glyphs and sigils on the sidewalk. Not enough to love. I pull you close to view the yellow centers of the celandine, the umbel of the primula, mucilaginous leaves of the scylla set in a basal rosette. Hounds come bounding out of the brush. One dog sniffs the other's rear. The first returns the favor. On the common at the corner, geese have seized the green. A gander wields his brawny bill and charges at your arm. Instinctively, you grab a branch and whack him on the back. He hobbles to the pond and goes berserk. We watch the mallard scatter, and you seed your piece of tree. Think of some benignity. Sky is bluer higher up, and deeper, ultramarine, lighter by the horizon, transparent as it eases into nearness. So I suppose that is a love poem. It's okay. No clapping. <laughs> I hear that um, Jennifer Connolly also says no clapping, and that's um, that's okay. Uh, the second one is um, a little bit of a reprieve. I, it's as close as I get to humor. <laughs> I don't do much humor, but seeing that we have um, a blues man here and uh, a folk man, I thought I would uh, read my ukulele poem. Do you, do you also play the ukulele, Jim? Okay, so um, my husband plays the ukulele and I play the recorder. <laughs> and, we <laughs> and we play duets. Okay, so <laughs> this is my ukulele poem. The man with the perfumed mustache. You wouldn't know the mustache was perfumed if not for the upstretched neck of the woman, sniffing it, smiling like briar rose. Nothing of the unusual happens, but the man has held across his chest a vintage ukulele.
So you assume he plays the good old tunes. I've been working on the railroad, camp town races, Buffalo gals, won't you come out tonight? Amazing Grace, America, which is the same as God saved the Queen with different words. This alignment together with the voracious way the woman conveys the rose scent of that mustache strikes me as expertly metrical. It is a copacetic moment. I'm happy. Surprised, I'm not happier. <laughs> oh, I had to come down at the end. No clapping. Okay, so I'm going to um, jump to the end and read um, a, a short poem. It's actually my newest poem, so um, John, it hasn't been workshopped. Yep, so it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's not certified. Uh, and, and it is also a kind of love poem, even though you might not know that from the title. Still Life with Knife. Seven lemons, melon, 19 spidery stripes on the rind, pomegranates, oxblood red, a match to the cinnabar bowl. For sentimental reasons, I am seeing your pout as a peach, the fullness of your lower lip, the soft vermilion border. The tulips, if I pinch them, Will you sense their subtle water sense the way they hardly tell? The sticky mango pressed into position by the plums. Two attached bananas, ripe and browning now, are marked. The moment frozen, even as you're reaching for the knife. Which brings me to the message that you left the other day. I'm super sorry. Super was the word that bowled me over. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so now we've got X Roadie, X Theater Tech. Ex subway driver, Jim McQuaig is now finding finger picking joy, or joy finger picking, or finger picking joy, finger picking East Coast blues and some originals. Welcome, Jim. This is a very strange kind of approach for me now. I, uh, I was born at Bloor and Sherburne. But for six weeks, I've been living in Magnetowan, which is about a four-hour drive north. I already feel like a stranger here. But that's OK. Loving it in Magnetowan. So um, I know that I'm not the only person here who didn't know I'm hacking. And uh, this guy was a wonderful singer-songwriter with all kinds of flaws, unfortunately. Uh, one of them was his size. He was like, at one time, he must have been close to 500 pounds. And uh, strangely, a lot of his songwriting incorporated the imagery of dancing. Uh, so <clears throat> I used to go to his place, and we would sip and talk. And I would noodle, and every once in a while, he would say, Jim, save that piece. And so every, after a while, I stitched a little bit of it together, and uh, I, I Call it Norm's tune in memory of him. He's, he's been gone for about eight years now. So here we go. Well, I should, the dancing thing, I try to make him dance out, even though he was a big guy.
So I was, uh, like almost everybody else who finger picks, I guess, I was taken with John Hurt early on. So I thought I'd do one of his tunes. Uh, Stagger Lee was written for a guy who actually existed. He was the illegitimate, illegitimate son of a, of a guy who owned a riverboat line. I never did ascertain whether he was as mean as they made him out to be, but he had every right to be. I'm going to do uh, another original uh, instrumental. This uh, was written for a, a guy that I knew many years ago. Uh, he was a trucker, and uh, he came from a long line of motorheads. He came by it honestly. His grandfather was uh, Barney Oldfield, one of the greatest racers back in the first days of automobile. And he, uh, he wanted something, so I said, OK. I, I, luckily, these things came together for me. I never have done it again. but. Uh, you got to try and imagine yourself in his rig through a day at work. And I call it Oldfield at the office. There was, you know, there's like, what do they call that sound when people, things like fade out into the distance as they go by? You hear that Doppler, Doppler effect. Yeah, so I got, I got a little Doppler effect in there.
Okay, this one is called Slow Drag. thing that I picked up via John Hurt, but originally came from a guy named Poole, who was a, you know, dance band guy back in the hills back in the day, but came up with a great tune called uh, Deep River Blues. Sweep along when I get down the deep river blue. You know, my old gal, she's a good old pal, but she walks just like a waterfowl, boys, when I get down the deep river blue. No one heard a cry for me, all them fish go on the spree when I get down the deep river blue. Give me back my old boat I'm gonna sail her if she float When I get them deep river blues now If my boat should sink for me I'll go down, don't you see? Cause I got them deep river blues and I'm gonna say goodbye And if I sink, just let me die I got them deep river blues. There was a guy who used to sing on uh, street corners in Atlanta, Blind, Billy, Blind Willie McTell. He, uh, he read, wrote a song that a lot of people really liked over the time. Almond Brothers were the first time I heard it. States were blue.
maybe it'll be refreshing, but this next thing is about nothing. is a playful tune. I wish I could remember the words to it, but it's, uh, it's all about sexual innuendo. So I guess we get to see what a guitar has to say about that. Got one more little thing here. Uh, got this as a white Axton tune originally, but uh, I like Leo Kotke's version of it. Uh, so I'm just sort of working this one out, but I'll play a little bit more anyway.
that was finger picking. <laughs> finger picking good. <laughs> I'm just so glad I have it on video and I've got the sound and oh, I'm going to enjoy that many, many, many more times. I'd like to thank you all for coming out and for our features, Susie and Alana and Jim and everybody who stepped up to open mic. You were terrific. It was a wonderful evening, beautiful space. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you.